are some of the more common mistakes people make with their tax returns? Well, here to talk with me about that is Dana Ansbach from Sensible Money. Dana, welcome. Hi, Bob. Great to be here. Great to have you here, and it'll be great to have you walk us through some of the mistakes that you encounter in your practice. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we're financial planners, and as part of that, we review tax returns each year for our clients. And I would say that, you know, 90%, maybe even higher, uh, 95% of those returns look just as we would expect them. And so it can be difficult to stay in that discipline process of reviewing the return each year, but it's the five to 10% where we discover something that, that makes that process worth it. And so I, what I want to talk about today are those things and we classify them into both like tax return mistakes we see and then missed opportunities. All right. So let's start with the mistakes then. We'll start with the mistakes. So uh, actually, I think I'll start with the most common mistakes. And so that would be missing 1099 income. And let me give you some specific examples. Once we encountered a client who got a pension every year, and one year that pension income was just missing. And somehow they had missed the 1099R. So if it's some type of retirement income that you get, you get a specific tax form called the 1099 are. And they had just missed it in the mail or email now. A lot of stuff comes electronically. It can be easy to miss those tax forms. And so their CPA didn't notice that, you know, it had been there the prior year. And so we were able to say, hey, it looks like like this wasn't reported. We've seen the same thing sometimes the first year someone claims Social Security. They will get a SSA-1099 from the Social Security office, and it will report that income. We've seen people miss that. We have seen clients where their accounts transition from one brokerage firm to another. And so during that year, they got two sets of 1099s, one from the old brokerage firm and one from the new brokerage firm. And they missed oftentimes the old brokerage firm because in their mind, that money had transferred and they could just disregard anything uh, that came from from that company. So we've seen that happen, uh, I would say, fairly frequently. Um, some other common ones, you can do a qualified charitable distribution from an IRA if you're age 70 and a half or older. But unfortunately, there's not a, a specific way to report that. And so you have to let your CPA know, let's say your, you know, your IRA distribution, you had a required distribution that was 30,000 and 10,000 of that went right to a charity. Well, you have to let your CPA know, hey, 10,000 of that is not taxable because it was a qualified charitable distribution. So I would say that's something pretty common. And then missing the basis on non-deductible IRA contributions. So you, you know, were working, you made too much money to contribute to a deductible IRA along the way. So you made non-deductible contributions. Well, there's a specific tax form that should be filed each year. And then when you take withdrawals from the IRA, each withdrawal, a portion of it's going to be a return of basis from that non-deductible contribution and a portion of it's going to be taxable. And so we've seen people who made non-deductible contributions for many, many years, but didn't track that. Now they're taking distributions and it's being reported as, as 100% taxable. I think um, that's probably the most common ones that are, that are coming to my mind. So, so Dana, one follow-up question. A lot of folks who might leave their employer and take a distribution from their 401k account, but not roll it over directly into another custodian, if they get the distribution, they'll get a 1099-R and then if they contribute that money back into a rollover, but as a check, that, that money might not be taxable, but they might think it is. Yeah, actually, Bob, that's an excellent point. So we encounter this quite a bit as people retire. They are rolling over a 401k plan, and most of those 401k uh, custodians will send the check to the address of record, and then it's up to the client to deposit it into their IRA account. And so that distribution would be reported on a 1099-R, but it's not taxable because it, it got rolled over. And so if you were just handing off the forms to your accountant uh, or tax preparer, it, it could be missed. You might need to make sure that they know, hey, this was a rollover distribution and it should not be taxable. You mentioned, I think, a bit ago, another interesting case that you had with a couple with an IRA distribution and withholding. 
Yeah, so we had a situation this year where a, a, a couple took the identical amount from their IRA accounts and it had the same tax withholding, you know, same gross dollar amount. And when we reviewed their tax return, only one amount was reported. And so we think what happened is they turned the 1099Rs into their tax preparer and it probably looked like a duplicate, like someone had just accidentally turned in the same form twice. You would have had to pay pretty close attention and look at the account numbers because other other than that, the distributions were identical. That's not such a common mistake. It's the first time we've encountered it, but it did make me think, wow, you know, if we do distributions from two spouses in the future, maybe we should change the dollar amount just a little bit from one to the other so it's a little more clear that these were, were two separate transactions. What about other types of 1099 mistakes, maybe with regard to uh, interest income or dividend income? Yeah, I think we talked about the one where, you know, somebody switches brokerage firms in the middle of the year. And so they're going to get two sets of, of 1099s because of that. Um, an unusual one we encountered in our review process in 2023 was a client who does hard money lending. And so they're going to get a 1099 miscellaneous is, is what it actually is. And that, sh that interest income on the hard money lending should be reported as ordinary income. But somehow it got reported as self-employment income. And so the CPA took it and assumed they had to pay self-employment taxes on it, which that's a significantly a higher amount of taxes than if you were just paying ordinary income tax on it. And so in our review process, we were like, why would she have all this extra self-employment income? And how come we don't see the right amount of interest income from this hard money lending? And we actually had to go all the way back. And it was the form that the hard money lender issued the, the interest income on. They actually reported it on the wrong tax form. And so it wasn't the tax preparer's fault. You know, they got that 1099. I can't remember if it was you know, the specific type of 1099 it was, but it was reported as if it had been earned income. And so we were able to point that out. The custodian for the hard money lender was able to correct that in the reporting process. And then the client ended up owing less taxes because now it was being reported correctly. Other missing items or other mistakes that you see? Um, so in our review process for, you know, and when I say our review process, we were reviewing 2022 returns. Uh, we had a client who had bought a house. So they had been moving in retirement. So they were renting and we knew they had, had finally bought a property. And so we were looking for mortgage interest on their tax return, but there wasn't any. And so they had simply forgot. They hadn't had mortgage interest in a few years. They hadn't taken that, you know, interest 1099 form and turned it into their CPA. So that was great because they got additional deductions because of that. We have seen missing capital gains and losses before where people simply, you know, forgot to report the gains or losses. Um, and it's not really income tax related, but we did have someone reach out uh, last year who had a pretty large estate and their wife had passed and a form 706, which is an estate tax form, had never been filed. And what happens is we have a pretty large amount we can exclude from our taxable estate right now. I think it's over $12 million. I don't remember the exact dollar amounts anymore. They've changed so much. But if you're married and you do everything right, then you can each exclude that amount. And so because this form hadn't been filed, it was possible that they would be miss the, the wife's exclusion. And again, they had a, had a pretty large estate. And so that took tracking down a CPA that was actually able to go back and, and figure out how to amend or fix the problem or file whatever needed to be filed. Um, you know, I think they had to request an exception from the IRS because the form hadn't been filed on time. What about um, uh, the QBI? Is that, uh, do people make mistakes with respect to that? So we had a situation this year where we have a client who was a property and casualty insurance agent. And it, this was actually their second year of being a client. And when they first came on board, 
we were looking at their tax return and I think it was the 2021 year, um, 2020, there had been a, a QBI deduction for them, but on the 2021 return, we didn't see one. And so it was, we reached out to them and said, you know, it's unusual. Your business hasn't changed. And so they forwarded that on to their, their accounting firm and it had just gotten missed. And so that resulted in a pretty big deduction for them. It was about a 20 to a $25,000 deduction for them. Um, then the crazy thing is the 2022 return comes along. And so we were reviewing that and we were like, how could this be? The QPI deduction is missed again. And so we reached out again and they touched base with their tax preparer who must be having a lot of staff turnover because the response this time was, oh, well, they're an insurance agent. So they are a specified service business and they wouldn't be eligible for that deduction, which kind of made us laugh because they've been eligible for it in the prior year. So that didn't make sense. But there's actually a special exemption for insurance commissions. So those types of commissions don't count as a specified service business. And there's a great article out there by one of our industry experts, Michael Kitsies, who even talks about people who have businesses that have insurance commissions and investment income uh, revenue and how they might be able to separate those out into two business entities to get the QBI. And I don't know if we defined what that is, but the qualified business income deduction on the insurance commission portion of the business. But in this case, where we caught the missing deduction two years in a row, I believe it's over $40,000 in saved taxes that we were able to find for, for that client just from, from reviewing the return. When you're reviewing returns, not only are you finding mistakes, but you're also finding what missed opportunities here and there. Yeah, there's some things, you know, I wouldn't qualify them as a mistake. Like, you know, the missing QBI deduction was a mistake. Um, if you received a 1099 and you simply forgot to report it, well, well, that we would count as a mistake. What we would call as a missed opportunity would be something like, um, the HSA deduction. So we actually see this pretty frequently. Somebody has a high deductible health plan, usually through their employer. And so they are eligible to make the family max contribution to the health savings account. Now, if they're 55 plus, they can also make a thousand dollar catch up contribution for themselves and for their spouse. And so we'll often see them, you know, making their own HSA contribution, but not taking advantage of the one they can do for their spouse or perhaps missing that they're both eligible for a catch up contribution. Now, there's one weird caveat in that, that if you are the primary, you know, HSA holder, you could put all of the family contribution and your own catch up contribution into your HSA account. But the thousand dollar catch up for your spouse, if they are also age 55 and older, would have to go into a HSA account in that spouse's name. And so maybe sometimes that's missed simply because people didn't want to open one extra account or they didn't know. But, you know, it's a small amount that's missing, but where else do we get triple tax deductions? You know, HSAs provide a very unique benefit. So I think that's pretty important. Uh, the other one that we, I don't know if this is a missed opportunity or a mistake, but it was a pretty cool thing we found for a client. They own a real estate firm and they're over 65 and still working. And so through the review process, they were claiming their insurance premiums as an itemized deduction. And so claiming, you know, any medical expenses. And our uh, tax specialist said, you know, because you're self-employed, you could claim this as a self-employed health insurance deduction, and it's going to give you a much larger deduction. And so they were able to take their Medicare premiums and move those to Schedule 1 as a self-employed health insurance deduction, and they were able to go back and amend three years worth of returns to take this deduction. And I believe it saved them over $10,000 in taxes just from, again, reviewing the return and pointing out this, this one opportunity to them. Many people are selling their homes and maybe in years past, they were able to sell their homes tax-free, but perhaps now because of the appreciation in home prices, they may be subject to taxes. And if they haven't saved their receipts, um, <laughs> they might find themselves paying a, a, a tax on the sale of their home. Yeah, that's a good point. So we encounter that a lot too, working with retirees because they might be downsizing or moving now that they're, you know, can, can move to a location sometimes to be closer to kids or to a lower 
you know, a state with lower income taxes or sometimes just to be in somewhere warmer, <laughs> all kinds of reasons that people might move when they retire. But they've owned their home for a long time. You know, as a single, you can exclude $250,000 of gain from capital gains taxes. As a married couple filing jointly, you can exclude up to half a million dollars worth of gain. But if you've been in your home a long time, many people have gains that are much larger than that. And they've also often made improvements to the home. And so if they have those records, then that can be really important in saving them money on taxes. But it's hard. You know, I was in a, a same home for 16 years and um, that home is now a, an Airbnb house. But when I think about selling it, I know there's repairs and improvements that I made. And I'm like, ooh, do I have those records? Like, how am I going to go back and find those? I should have just at least saved a shoebox with a big note that said home improvements, you know, and you just drop everything in there so that one day it's all easily located. It's hard because we don't think of it at the time. Yeah. And, and the gist of it is those home improvements uh, get added to the cost basis of your house. And then when on the sale, it sort of increases or decreases the amount of capital gains. Yes. Yes, it does. So, you know, if you put $100,000 into your home and you get to add that to your basis at a rough 20% capital gains tax rate, that having those receipts just saved you $20,000. So it, it can be some substantial savings. So a word to the wise, get that shoebox <laughs> with your receipts. Yeah. Uh, any other missed opportunities that, that you come across? You know, again, I don't know if I would call it a missed opportunity, but we have reviewed returns where, of course, the, the tax preparer will set up quarterly payments for the upcoming year. And sometimes the upcoming year isn't going to look anything like the prior year, especially as you enter retirement. And so there's been times where we've been able to go back and say, you know, um, those payments aren't actually necessary because your income is going to be so much lower this year, your taxable income. And so, you, you know, no reason to pay all of that in and then just get it back when you file. So I don't know if that's, you know, maybe a missed opportunity in terms of now we can actually earn interest on our money. And so that money could be, you know, sitting in a money market or a CD or earning something for you instead of in the IRS's hands. The other thing I've encountered with quarterly payments is a situation where all the federal payments have been set up, but no state payments have been set up. And in this situation, the client did need to make those quarterly payments. And so we reached out to the tax preparer and said, you know, we noticed there's federal payments, but no state payments. Is there any reason why? Because maybe there's something we don't know about. We, you know, we don't, don't always have the right answer. So we want to work as a team with the client's tax, tax people. And so they wrote back and it had just been an oversight. They just missed it. And and so they were able to set the client up on a, on a tax payment. And it would have been a small underpayment penalty, but why pay that underpayment penalty if you don't need to? So Dan, as you're talking, it strikes me that while C we trust CPAs to do right by us, but they make mistakes now and then, and it's worth having a backstop at, at times. It is. And, and, you know, like I said, 90, 95% of the returns that we see look just the way they should. And I think it's just having that second pair of eyes can help find these things and working as a team, being open-minded. We try to be open-minded too. You know, we want second pair of eyes on our work and, and it's all in service of a better outcome for the client and, and tax savings for the client. So I, I think there's definitely value in, in working as a team. So we covered a lot of ground. Anything we missed or just bears reemphasizing? Um, the only other thing I can think of is I find myself telling people this every year is your tax preparers are so busy during tax season and there is absolutely nothing wrong with filing an extension. So in our view, you're going to reduce these types of mistakes and errors if your tax people are working on it during a calmer time where they're not rushed and they're not trying to meet a deadline. So we tell people, look, if you have a complicated situation or even if it's simple and you're not in a hurry, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with filing an extension. 
in my view, I, you know, I always file an extension because I want the best of my tax people. <laughs> I want them when they're fresh. I don't want them when they might be working, you know, 12 to 18 hours a day. So I always like to pass that information along. Sometimes people are terrified of filing an extension as if that's going to put them on the IRS radar screen. And it really, it won't. It's, it's perfectly okay to do that. In, in the case when you do file for an extension, people should be forewarned that if they anticipate a tax liability, they do have to pay that by the due date. But you but, uh, do. So you still have to have some type of projection to say, do you think you will owe or get a refund? And if you think you're going to owe, you still need to make that payment by April 15th. But then you have all of the time to gather the formal documentation. And, you know, if you wanted to, you could extend all the way into the fall. And and so it just buys you more time to be more thorough. And, and for folks who are getting K-1s, perhaps late in the year, late in the tax filing cycle, it helps their accountant at least deal with late, late K-1s. It does. K-1s are notoriously late, and uh, it's because the entity has to get all of its tax documents in order before it can send you your tax documents. And so in those cases, you know, you could send everything to your tax person, or if you're doing it yourself, you could prep everything and then just drop that K-1 information in last, or you can just plan on filing an extension. You're probably going to have to anyway, because the K-1s uh, usually ar arrive late. Yeah. Well, this has been as taxing a topic as we've ever discussed. <laughs> Sorry for the pun. <laughs> it has been, but there's, of course, you know, a lot of opportunities and we all want to pay our fair share, but no more than is legally necessary. 